Uh, 1 Samuel, we are going to pick up where we left off. We kind of slowed down in our study of the book yesterday. We're going to speed it back up again so that we can get to the end of the book by the end of today. There's been a transition that has taken place in the last three chapters of our study. We saw yesterday how King Saul sinned against the Lord in chapter 15. Uh, he was told to go and complete the destruction of the Amalekite people, to destroy all the people, to destroy all the animals and all that they had. It was a judgment that God was carrying out uh, according to his just decision. And Saul did not do that completely. He did not fully follow the Lord. And when he finally admitted his sin, which took a little while, his first concern was not with what the Lord's delight was, but about what the people would think of him, about how his honor would be affected. God's response to him was to confirm that the kingdom would be taken away from him and given to another man who was better than him. One after God's own heart, God said in chapter 13 and verse 14. So in chapter 16, we saw how Samuel was sent to the small town of Bethlehem to the family of Jesse, where God said, you wait there, I will show you what you must do, and I will choose from among the sons of Jesse who my next king will be. Well, when Jesse gets to Bethlehem in chapter 16, the first son of Jesse that he sees is the oldest, Eliab. And the, the scripture says in verse 6, 5 and 6, that he looked at Eliab and he said, surely that's the guy that God has chosen. And the text emphasizes that he looked at the man and deduced that must be the king. It had something to do with his appearance. But God says to Samuel in verse 7 of chapter 16, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord looks, or for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And in chapters 16 and 17, we have Samuel, the prophet. We have uh, Jesse, David's father. We have Eliab, the oldest brother. We have Saul, the king. We have Goliath, the giant champion of the Philistines. All of them who look at the youngest son of Jesse, David, and say, he doesn't look like he can be this great and mighty one. But God sees differently. And David is the son that God has chosen. What, what God saw in David was a heart filled with righteous anger. His first concern with the Lord was with the Lord and His honor. He had a heart of service for the weak. He had a heart that trusted in God's promises and a heart that gave God the credit for his victories. David is a man after God's own heart. Chapter 17 is where we ended with David's defeat of Goliath. Really, God's victory over Goliath. And in chapter 18... They're coming home from that battle with the Philistines. Saul and David and all the army. And we are told that as he comes, as they all are coming back home, that the women are singing a song out loud, welcoming the troops home. And the song says in verse 7, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Three times in chapter 18, we're told that David behaved very wisely in all that he did. Verse 5, verse 14, verse 30. We're told that all the servants of Saul came to respect, highly respect David. And in fact, Saul's own son Jonathan, who normally would be expected to be the next king, actually takes off his robe and his armor and his sword and his belt and bow and puts them on David, signifying Jonathan's own faith that David is really the next one to take the mantle of king. It seems he knows. And Saul's daughter, we're told in chapter 18, comes to love David. Her name is Michael. And so all of these people are giving David, you know, a respect because David has shown faith in the Lord and David is showing wise behavior in the Lord. How does Saul respond to all of that? 
In verse 8, it says, when, David, when Saul hears that song, Saul has slain his ten thousands, David is ten thousands. It says in verse 8 that Saul became very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they've ascribed only thousands. Now what more can David have but the kingdom? And with this anger, as you continue to read through the chapter in verses 20 to 28, he comes up with a little plan. He knows that uh, he would like to... He knows uh, eventually that, uh, that Michael, his daughter, loves David, is interested in him. So he says to David, David, I'll let you marry him, marry her, if you will go and kill 100 Philistines. And David goes and he kills 200. That's not what Saul had hoped for. The scripture says Saul had hoped that when he went to fight for those 100 Philistines that he would be killed. Verses 28 and 29 are the summary. Thus Saul knew, and thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David, so Saul became David's enemy continually. Let's be clear: Saul knows that the Lord is with David. Verse 12 says so, and yet he makes David his enemy anyway. In doing that. He's really making the Lord his enemy too, isn't he? And at this point, we face another one of those questions again that we face through every one of our studies so far, okay? Saul, if you're going to know that David uh, has the Lord with him and you are going to make David your enemy anyway, if you were God... Would you have allowed Saul to continue in his kingship? We know who is good and who is evil in these events, right? We know who is humble and who is proud in these events, right? It's very clear. God, why not just bring Saul to death now? Or take him away from the kingship now? Defeat him now and make David the king? If I were God, that's what I would do. Now, I'm saying that again in light of all the things that we've talked about in our lessons so far. When we start to say, if I were God, here's what I would do. Well, but we're putting ourselves in the place of God. And we are not God. God is a God of knowledge, a God of power, a God of goodness and holiness. What possible reason, we ask though, could He have for allowing Saul to continue as king and the struggle to continue between Saul and David? Well, let's keep that question in our minds as we push on into chapter 19. What happens in chapter 19? In verse 1, Saul comes right out to his son Jonathan and to his servants, and he says, I want you to kill David. Okay, that's pretty blunt. But what does Jonathan do? He goes to David and tells him to hide, and then goes to the king, and in verse 4, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he's not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, that's Goliath, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Saul listened and he invites David to come back. But in verse 8, there's war again. And David goes off to battle again. And it says that he is very successful again. Verse 8, he strikes the Philistines with a mighty blow and they flee from him. And how does Saul respond? <clears throat> At David again. And it says he tries to kill David. David runs off home to where his wife Michael is. And Michael says, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. She had some awareness somehow that he was in danger. She lets him down through the window so that he might escape secretly while Saul is sending messengers to surround the place to capture David at home to take him, to kill him. Already in chapter 19, we see that Saul's family is turning against him. And they are turning against him because they are recognizing that they really can't um, 
turn against David because the Lord is with him. And as I think about this chapter and I see Jonathan turning against his father to defend David and I see Michael turning against her father to defend David, what I begin to see is that Saul's life is starting to just be destroyed piece by piece. It's like, a, a, you know, like he's a brick foundation and bricks are being taken out one by one as he continues to rebel against God. I want you to turn to Psalm 59. Keep your finger here in Psalm 50, uh, in 1 Samuel 19. And turn to Psalm 59. You probably recall that David wrote many of the Psalms. Psalms are poems, songs, uh, words of prayer, words of praise, poetry, many written by David through the inspiration of the Spirit, but some written by others. And some of these psalms were written in connection with certain events in David's life. And if you look at Psalm 59 and look at the top of that psalm, you will see a note before the psalm begins. This one says, to the chief musician set to do not destroy. There's some instructions about the music that would go with this. A victim of David when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. This was a psalm written in connection with what was happening in 1 Samuel 19. We're not going to read the whole psalm. We don't have time. But if we were to read verses 1 to 7, and you can start to look over the words, you will see that David is crying out to God to be delivered from his enemies. He clearly trusts in God for his deliverance. And he points out, you can see this in verse 3 and 4, that these things are happening to, the, to him for no fault of his own. He has done nothing wrong. He doesn't understand why he is being attacked. But he's crying out to God for his defense. And in verses 18, 8 to 17, God, David knows that God will be his defense. David is humbled and asks that God will destroy them. But I want you to look at verse 11. We are going to read verses 11 to 13. In the middle of this cry to God and his trust that God will deliver him, David says this, verse 11, Do not slay them, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Lord our shield, for the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips. Let them even be taken in their pride, and for the cursing and lying which they speak, consume them in wrath, consume them that they may not be, and let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. That is a really interesting phrase to me in verse 11. Do not slay them, God. It says that in some form or another in every translation that, that I took a look at. Don't kill them, God, but rather do what? New King James says, scatter them by your power. The English Standard Version says, kill them not, lest my people forget. Make them totter with by your power and bring them down. What does it mean to totter? It's not a word we use very often. Now, there, uh, if you talk about a, I don't know what they call them in Canada. I can't remember. You know there's names for things here that are slightly different than the States. You know what a teeter-totter is? Is that what they call them here? Okay. Seesaw. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm used to. Seesaw. You know, it's uh, you take the piece of wood and it goes across something in the middle and a child can get here and here and they can get on and they can do this, right? You'll often find those in parks and playgrounds where kids are on swings. What the, It's called a teeter-totter because it is balanced on something, but it's just about to fall. In fact, the children make it fall either direction. But being balanced on something, it, it's there, but it's very close to falling over. We call that tottering. Right? Some games are made like that, some board games. You might put little pieces on top of something that's balanced, and if you put too much on one side, you know, it topples over. I find that really interesting that David's concern and prayer is that he does not seem to want too quick an end to his enemies, lest some lesson not be learned. At least that's what I seem to gather from this. He seems to be suggesting, God, please take a different approach so that people learn some things from this. 
That's pretty amazing. I think I mean, people learn from slang, right? And David's basically saying that might be too quick to where people don't really get the full message that they could get. And that caused me to think back to Hophni and Phineas. Do you remember how we asked the question back in the first couple of chapters of 1 Samuel 1? Those were the very bad priests in the beginning of this book. And we asked the question, well, if God has identified them as evil leaders, why don't you just take them out right now? And one of the answers that we gave to that is sometimes God allows situations like that to continue so that people can more clearly see the difference between good and evil. And in watching that evil, you can see that while they look powerful, they're not really. They are right on the edge, tottering, ready to be destroyed. Think about that as you think about how we see Saul in the rest of the book of 1 Samuel. Here is a fellow that we're going to find tottering throughout all the rest of the book, getting more and more shaky until finally his death. Saul's, Saul's tottering we see in 1 Samuel 19 with his family already turning against him. In the rest of chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, when David runs to Samuel, God protects David from being taken. When you get to chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, Saul gets so angry that when Jonathan defends David, Saul eventually says, Are you crazy? You're my son. You would have the kingdom after me. And then he basically tries to kill his own son, Jonathan. And it becomes clear in chapter 20 that Saul's pride and envy have become so great that David has to run far away. And now we flip over to thinking about David. Why does David have to run? If I were God, would I put David into this situation where he had to run? It doesn't matter what I think I would do if I were God. That's what God chooses to do in this situation. Why doesn't God speak to, to David and say, here is where you will go and you will be perfectly safe there? What we see instead is that as David flees, he's not quite sure where to go. In chapter 21, he goes first of all to the priests that live in Nob, and he's hopeful there that he can get some food, and he's hopeful he can get a weapon, and he obtains those things. But when we look at what he does in chapter 21, it appears that he's starting to tell some lies about what's going on, deceiving others to try to, you know, to, to be safe. And as we move on in chapter 10, I'm sorry, in chapter 21, when he leaves the priests, he realizes, where can I go in Israel? I'm being sought for everywhere. And he runs off to the king of the Philistines. It says in chapter 21, verse 10, down to the end of the chapter, that when he gets to the king of the Philistines, David is there, but some of the, the people of the Philistines says, hey, wait a minute, that's the guy they sung about in Israel. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousand. That's him, right? And it says that David, when he realized that they recognized him. In verse 12, it says, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Now, the reason why I read that verse is because in my mind, we've not seen David in that position before. He's running from his life or for his life, but there's a picture of him here where he doesn't know where to go and he is sore afraid as at least one of the tra uh, translations says. <clears throat> David is lying and deceiving. He's pretending that he is crazy. The king believes it here. I think we're meant to understand that David wasn't quite sure what to do. Someone will say, are we saying that David sinned? I would say, yes. It looks like he's behaving in a foolish and sinful way. We obviously don't have time to go into all the detailed questions we might ask about that, but if that's true, if David has sinned, well, why isn't David's kingship taken away like Saul's then? David has sinned. He should have his kingship taken away. Isn't that what happened with Saul? That's a great question, I think. I think the book presents us, at least, with that question. How do you compare David and Saul? Here 
here's how I answer that question. I think what we're starting to see is that it's something that we already recognize. We recognize it naturally and we recognize it through the reflection of Scripture as we read it. What we're starting to see is that no man is perfect. That all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And I think to myself, if God cast us away forever, you know, the first time that we sin, and there was no chance for repentance, none of us could ever stand before His presence. David needed to repent of his sin to be right with God. I think you even recognized it. And for sake of time, we're not going to read these psalms, but Psalm 34 and Psalm 56, if you look at the tops of those psalms, were psalms that David wrote while he was in this situation. And in Psalm 34, it's really interesting, the top of that psalm says, written in connection with the time that David went to Achish and pretended to be crazy. And in that psalm, David basically says, let no man lie or deceive. God is the deliverer. And I think that psalm was probably written in realization afterward that he had acted foolishly. That God ultimately is the deliverer. But why was Saul's kingship taken away and not David's? I would point out two things that I see in the text. And this is just what I see. God hasn't answered the question directly. But what we've observed in the comparison between Saul and David so far is that Saul knew what the Lord wanted him to do. He had a word from the Lord, both in chapter 13 and 15. Saul, here is what you should do. Wait for Samuel seven days. Saul, go destroy the Amalekites and all that they have. But I think we're supposed to see in these chapters with David, that David at this point had not yet heard exactly what the Lord wanted him to do. And he was struggling with that. Saul, we've seen, was not really concerned about seeking and depending on the Word of God. But David would love to have God's Word and would love to find it. Why do I say that about David? First of all, because he went to Samuel in chapter uh, 19. I don't know what he might have learned uh, any more than what the text reveals there. But it's interesting that he went after the prophet of God, hopeful to talk to him and perhaps to figure out what's next. In chapter 22, where we're at right now, and in verse 3, when David's not kind of sure what to do, he goes to the king of Moab, hopeful that he can find some help for his father and mother who might be in danger. And look at 22 and verse 3. David went to Mizpah of Moab and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. Do you see what David's interested in? I want to know what it is that God wants me to do. In verse 5, when finally a prophet does speak to David that we see in the text, it says the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. David did not say that would be dumb to leave my protection and go out into a place that would be less protected. Why should I leave the stronghold? David didn't do that. When the prophet said go into the, into the land, David departed and went into the forest of Herod. He hears a word from the Lord and he acts on it. And then finally, in chapter 23, it says, Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against the city of Keilah. They're robbing the threshing floors. Verse 2 says, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again, and the Lord answered and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines in your hand. And verse 5 says, He went, they fought, and they won, because the Lord delivered them. It's like, whoa, what happened here? Now all of a sudden, David's able to talk with the Lord? Something has changed. We haven't read it yet, but in chapter 22, Saul has destroyed almost all of the priests, but one escapes and joins David. And that priest has an ephod, the garment of the priest, by which they could use the Urim and Thummim and inquire of the Lord His will. 
David has that now, it says in verse 6. It happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. So as soon as David has the means whereby he can uh, inquire of the Lord and the Lord will answer him, that's what he wants to know. And when he, he hears that a city of Israel is being attacked, even though he is on the run from Saul, he's like, well, those people are in trouble. We can talk to the Lord. Lord, do you want us to go? Yes, go. And all the men who are with them are like, we're in danger. Saul is chasing us. David says, Lord, what do you think? Go fight. We're going. His fear has left him. David's fear has. Because he's able to understand now what God's will is. Compare that to Saul. When Saul knew clearly what the Lord's word was, who did he fear? Chapter 15, when he explains himself finally, he says, I feared the people. There's a big difference between the two. David is seeking the Lord. Saul really is not. The promise of Jesus in Matthew 7.7 7 is, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. That is, if you want to know the will of the Lord, you have His promise that you will come to find it. But it all begins with your desire. David had that desire. Saul did not. In fact, in this chapter 23, when Saul hears from his, his contacts in the land that David has entered into the city of Keilah, and Keilah has gates and bars and things that make it difficult to go out, in and out of the city, he's like, David is in the city of Keilah? He is trapped there. And notice what he says in verse 7. Saul was told that David had gone into Keilah, and Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. For he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Did God deliver David into Saul's hand? No. <laughs> in fact, what does David do? In verse 9, when he knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring that ephod here. We want to know what the Lord has to say we should do. And David cries out, O Lord God of it, or, or inquires of the Lord, through, uh, through the priest. O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down? Tell me. And the Lord says, yes, you're in danger here. And so David leaves. Saul is assuming that, oh, you know, I, I guess this is God's work. Now I'm going to be able to destroy David. That is not what God has said at all. Saul knows that what God has said is that His own kingdom be taken away and given to another. All of this is pointing really to the statement that's the title of our lesson, which is that God destroys the proud, but He does give grace to the humble. Saul is not seeking God. David is. Saul is tottering. We've already seen he's lost his son and daughter. He has lost the prophet, if you will, in chapter 22 and verse 6. We've not read this yet, but after David visits the priests, Saul comes by. And he says, what's happened here? You, you've helped David, haven't you? And the priests are like, we had no idea what's going on. And Saul says, no, you helped him. You inquired of the Lord. And there's a man there, Doeg the Edomite, who had been there when David stopped earlier. And Doeg said, yes, they helped him. Saul's not willing to listen at all to what the truth of the matter is. He accuses the priests and ordered that they be put to death. The reaction of his servants is, what? We're not going to put the priest to death? But Doeg says, I'm doing it. And all the priests are killed, except for Abithar, who runs away. So what is Saul doing? Do you remember the bricks? <laughs> his family has already turned against him. He doesn't have access to a prophet. Now he's just pulling the priesthood of God out from under his feet. Priesthood is destroyed. When David runs out towards 
the area of the wilderness of Ziph. It says at the end of chapter 23, chapter 23, verses 14 to the end. A look at verse 19. It says, The Ziphites came to Saul and said, Is not David hiding with us in the strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hecula, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. Saul gets another word. David is hiding over here. The men of Ziph have told me. And his reaction to them in verse 21 is, Blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. And you can tell in all of his reaction, he's trying very carefully to make sure he traps David, but the Lord is not with him. He's just trying to depend on his own mind to figure it out. He comes close, but God delivers him. He is tottering and tottering and tottering. So finally in chapter 28, Saul doesn't know what to do. It says in chapter 28 that in verse 3 that Samuel had died. And all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums out of the land. Remember how we talked about the witches and things that God did not want in the land? People would go to these witches and these mediums and try to talk to the dead to learn special information. Well, that was all false. God had condemned it in the law. Saul, at one point, had kicked all of those folks out of the land. But... It says in verse 6, When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Basically, at this point, God is not going to talk to such a heart. And that is a sad thing to see. Saul is so desperate at this point, the dangers around him so great, that it says in verse 7, Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. All right. Let's go find one of those witches. By the time you get to the end of chapter 8, God has delivered a message to him that says, You will die, you and your sons, in battle to the Philistines. There is no hope left for you. It's a destroyed life that Saul leads. And I think we're meant to see by all of these chapters in 1 Samuel that God has allowed this to continue so that people will learn things. David is learning to depend more and more on the Word of God. That's what he's seeking. He, he makes foolish decisions, some that we haven't even read throughout this, 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 this time, but he learns more and more that he needs to trust on the Word of the Lord. Saul, his life is being destroyed. And it doesn't matter how hard he tries to work against the Lord, all he does is keep making things worse and worse and worse. Have you guys experienced that in your life before? Have you ever kicked against God? Knew what it was He wanted you to do, but you just kept pushing against that and you saw you weren't really getting anywhere. And in fact, you were destroying your life brick by brick. I think we're meant to see Saul tottering over time to learn that it doesn't matter how long we kick, we will never escape the word of the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 5, as we conclude, verse 5 beginning, 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, the scripture says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, yes, all of you, to be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, because God resists the proud but He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. I encourage you to hear the word of the Lord and the message of 1 Samuel today that God does destroy the proud. Those who seek Him, humbly hear Him, obey Him, which is God's delight, those God will exalt.